Good evening, everybody. We're so glad you're here for another installment of Thursday Night Bible Study. Uh, we have been making our way through the, uh, the letter of Paul to the Philippians. We've been through chapter 1. We finished chapter 2 the last time we're together, so that means we are halfway done. Uh, we're ready for chapter 3. So if you, uh, uh, if you grab your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, we'll get rocking and rolling here. <coughs> Philippians 3, 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Think for a second uh, of, of all the, of the accolades and awards you've received in your life. Is there one or two that you're most proud of? Some trophy, a certificate on the wall, something you're extra proud of? You're glad you accomplished it? Okay. Well, that's, that's sort of the direction that Paul is headed in, uh, in this section of Philippians. He's talking about um, some, some teachers who have come into the church in Philippi uh, who are super proud of what they have accomplished and what they have done, how faithful they are to the law, um, all of the good things that they do. Um, you may have picked a little bit of that up as we read through those first four verses. <clears throat> um, in, in the two chapters we've talked about so far, uh, Paul has shared his hopes and his prayers, and he, he has given some imperatives. Um, if you just want to flip back one page, we'll just kind of skip uh, through it very quickly. Uh, in verses 9 through 11, Paul uh, uh, prays, that the Philippians would grow more and more in knowledge and depth of, in, depth of insight, discernment, purity, blamelessness, fruitfulness, glory, and praise of God. He wants them to continue to grow. Okay? Uh, roll on down to verse 27. Whatever happens then, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So what's the, what's the challenge? What's the imperative? Live worthy of the gospel. Live like you've been changed by the gospel. Uh, down uh, the beginning of chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Uh, that's kind of a long section. I'll just kind of summarize it here. Paul says, Be like-minded in love, in spirit, and in mind. Value others above yourselves, looking to their interests. Have the same mind as Christ Jesus. On down in verse 12, another imperative. Uh, as you have always obeyed, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Not a huge fan of that verse when it's triple digits. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Uh, and then down in verse 18, one last one. Uh, you should be glad and rejoice with me. So he, he keeps giving these, throwing out these commands, these expectations, hopes, dreams, and prayers for, um, for the people. Uh, when we get started here in chapter 3, he leads off with one of those. Brothers and sisters, what do we do? Rejoice, Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Uh, it means to be glad. And I believe that what Paul is doing is saying something like, hey, you all stay happy for a minute because whatever comes next, you're probably not going to like very much. It may come across as sort of judgmental or harsh or unpleasant to deal with. It might be awkward. But you just stay smiling. You keep rejoicing in God because what I have to share with you really is uh, for your benefit. No matter what may come, 
maintain a joyful spirit. Uh, and then so that's when the hard part comes. Um, he talks about opponents that are out there. He says in verse 2, he gives them three names. Uh, first of all, he says that they're dogs. Then he says they are evildoers. And then he says they're mutilators. Okay, let's talk a little bit about each one of those. <clears throat> uh, if you call somebody a dog, it's probably not necessarily a sweet thing, a term of endearment. You dirty dog. Um, same thing is true here. What, what Paul is, is aiming at are not your garden variety labs and doodles and poodles and spaniels that are sweet and floppy-eared and cuddly and drooly. Um, he's talking about the wild bands of dogs that lived outside the city, um, that would run into the city to steal food. Um, they were vicious. You didn't go up and pet these dogs. They would attack people um, in, in packs. Again, calling somebody a dog is, doesn't mean you love them very much. These people, whoever they are, are vicious and dirty. Um, they would probably even be considered unclean animals because of all the disgusting things that dogs eat. Okay? So he's really talking about an animal as a dog? No. He's saying that some of these people are absolute dogs because of the way they behave. Okay. He is not talking about an actual canine. Uh, he calls them dogs. He also calls them evil doers. Um, literally, they are workers of evil, um, which focuses on their commitment to work, doing things. Um, this, this group of people uh, these men and, and probably women are committed to carrying out the law of Moses. This group is probably the group known as the Judaizers. They want people to become Jews before they become a follower of Jesus. And so because of that, they're going to work extra hard to check all of their boxes. They're going to eat the right food. They're going to trim their beards or not. They're going to wear tassels on their clothes. They're going to follow all the dietary laws. They're going to do everything possible because that's what they think they need to do to follow Christ. They are, they are workers. Paul says they are workers of evil. Grace is not about all of those things. And the last name he gives them is mutilators. And that is because, as Judaizers, one of the first things that they would command Gentiles to do would be uh, to be circumcised. Above everything else, first move for every man who is not a Jew to become a follower of Christ, well, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. Physical obedience is way more important to this group than anything else. And so Paul looks at all of those things. You, they're dogs, they are workers of evil, they, all they care about is the law, and they will do whatever is necessary to your body. All they want to do is cut you up. The warning for the Philippians is, stay awake, be alert for them, uh, be on guard, watch out for them. The Judaizers have been around for a while. They've kind of moved from place to place to try to convince people that they should convert to Judaism before they can follow Jesus. There's nothing in the New Testament that would tell us that that's necessary. Actually, when you look in the book of Acts, you see the exchange between Cornelius and Simon Peter in Acts chapter 10. You know, Peter was up on the roof and he had this vision of this sheep coming down out of heaven full of all kinds of creatures with a voice that said, eat it. Like there's snakes and crabs and seagulls and crawdads and all kinds of nasty stuff bacon. in there. Hmm? Oh, bacon. yeah, some bacon. Well, it's not all bacon. <laughs> the sheep comes down, eat it. I'm not going to eat that, Lord. I wouldn't ever eat anything unclean. And it goes up and it comes down. Three times it comes down with the, with the command 
eat it, do not call anything unclean that I have called clean. He goes to the house. He meets Cornelius the Roman, who, is, who absolutely is a man of deep faith, who wants to honor God with his life. And then Peter understands that God has thrown open the door to Gentiles as well as Jews. Okay, So this is not a new... Uh, a new argument that's taking place. It's been around at least for a few years, and Paul is still battling it. Um, even in a, a Greek city, a Macedonian city like Philippi, don't let them convert you to follow Jesus. They say that circumcision and following the law is everything. They call themselves the circumcision group. Well, I'm here to tell you, Paul says, verse four. Uh, verse 3, we are the circumcision. Okay, he had three, three names for this group, and so he picks up three names for, for uh, his group as well. Who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Yes, ma'am. So, was converting to Judaism ever a thing before? Because I can understand why you convert somebody into Christianity, but you were the people, you are God's chosen people. This is a lineage thing. So. Since the Old Testament, there were rules, there were guidelines for anybody who wanted to become a Hebrew. So you that could do it. You could become, okay. you could become part of God's nation in the Old Testament. Uh, because we know that there were people like in the land of Canaan who were not Jews who ended up being a part of the nation. Uh, the first one that comes to mind would be Rahab, uh, the, the prostitute from Jericho. She's not a good little Jewish girl, but in order for her to be a part of, of the people and for her to marry who she did to become a part of the lineage of Jesus, she would have had to become a proselyte. That's the fancy word for that. Sorry. Sacrifices, washing, uh, there's a whole process. If I'd been anticipating that question, which I should have, I could have said, well, let's go back to Deuteronomy and take a look at that. So it wasn't a completely off weird question? No. Okay. No. You'd been able to become a Jew for thousands of years at that point. <clears throat> okay. Uh, hmm. Verse 4. If anyone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So this, this group of opponents, they think that they have all the answers. That anybody that they meet should go, Oh my, these people, they're something special. We should do everything that they tell us to do. And Paul says, look, if, if there's anybody who thinks that they have a reason to brag, if they've got any, any great rewards or accolades or, or credentials in themselves, well, let's talk about me for just a minute. It sounds kind of braggy, but I believe he's trying to make a point uh, for these false teachers. If anyone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, which is what circumcision would have been, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Okay, so the Judaizers have been emphasizing tradition and heritage. You can kind of hear Tevye in the background uh, doing, doing his little song. Uh, that's, that's what the Judaizers really are all about, except they really do believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Their confidence is in their DNA and their heritage, their culture, and their obedience to the law. And so Paul sees that, that this, this group is putting all of their confidence in the flesh. Their boasting, their pride is in what they have done. It's in the flesh. Paul says, well, let's take a look at that. If you want to brag about things that you've accomplished, I'd like to throw myself out as exhibit B, okay? Um, 
He's put his confidence not in himself or what he's done or his background. He has put his confidence in Christ Jesus. If anybody has reasons to brag, it would be Paul. And so he, he lists some of those things. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about each one of those things. Um, he is an Israelite. Now, I, I did anticipate this question, which no one will ask. Um, so James, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's people have different names. Like sometimes they're Israelites, sometimes they're Hebrews, sometimes they're Jews. Are they all the same people? I'm so glad you asked. Let me give you an answer for that. Okay, so from the very beginning, um, after, after the flood and Noah and his boys and all of their wives are, um, are free from the ark, they begin to repopulate the earth. One of the sons, Shem, is the ancestor for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that whole tree. That's why sometimes you hear about um, Semites, anti-Semitism, or a Semitic language that comes from Shem, the son of Noah. So that's the big tree that, um, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Arabs too, um, from Ishmael, they'd all be in kind of in that big part of the family tree. <clears throat> okay, um, if you go a little bit further, uh, closer in history, they're sometimes called Hebrews. Um, usually that's a, uh, just for the descendants of Abraham. Um, nobody's exactly sure where the root of the word comes from. It could be a couple different things. Um, the one that I like the best um, is that uh, the, the original word meant to pass over, which is meaningful for Jews, or it can also mean traverse, uh, to, to do a lot of voyaging. And so if you look at Abraham, Abraham came from Ur over in Babylonian Empire. He came all the way across the Middle East, across the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, over to, uh, first up to Haran, and then down to Canaan, and then he traveled to Egypt and back, and then his, his descendants did a lot of traveling around. They were kind of nomads. Um, the, uh, later on, uh, the, his descendants, the sons of Jacob, uh, the, the 12 tribes went to Egypt and traveled back. So they're a, a traveling group. So it could just mean that Hebrew means traveler, voyager, um, nomad. Um, one of the scholars says that it probably means foreign people across the river, which for me growing up is Kentucky. So, uh, Semites, Hebrews, at some point they become Israelites. Remember when that happened? Abraham's son Isaac, when he was married, had two boys, Jacob and Esau, twins. Um, and at some point when Jacob is on the lamb because he kicked off his brother, um, as he's sleeping one night, he ends up wrestling with a messenger from God, maybe even with Jesus himself. Don't really know. Um, but he, uh, at the end of that event, his name goes from Jacob, which means heel grabber or sort of trickster, to um, he who wrestles with God. That's what Israel means that's one of one of the definitions um, wrestles with God or a man who has seen God one who has power with God but it has to do with that that interchange there um, in the in the wilderness and then so all the people who are descended from Jacob Israel are his 12 sons uh, who become the 12 tribes um, uh, one of the one of the ideas is that before slavery, um, before slavery and, and up before the Exodus, they're Hebrews, and after they move back into Canaan and overtake it, then they're Israelites. Okay? They're also called in the Old Testament 
Jews. Uh, in case you don't remember, and I'll go fast because I know you don't care. Jacob's 12 sons have these names. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. That's all 12. After they left uh, slavery in Egypt and moved back to Canaan, um, 12 tribes divided up the territory. Levi got no territory because they were going to be scattered everywhere to work as religious leaders. And so um, Joseph's two sons, because he was the favorite son, got a double share, Manasseh and Ephraim. So that's why there's, there's still 12 tribes. One of those tribes, Judah, was identified as the royal line. It's the royal tribe of, uh, of Israel. And so after King Saul failed, and after King David's death and King Solomon's death, the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel, that kingdom of 12, split into northern and southern. Ten tribes went north, two tribes stayed south, Judah and Benjamin. The northern tribes went by the name Israel. They eventually went into exile in Assyria and kind of dissolved. Judah and Benjamin also went off into exile in Babylon, if you were there part of the Daniel study. Um, and then they came back. All of the kings of Judah were descended from Judah, from, from that tribe. David and Solomon and on through to the, to the end. <clears throat> okay, so after they went to, to Babylon and were in captivity, the people there just referred to them as the Judah people, the Judeans, the, the, the Jews, the Yehudim. So that's where that comes from. That's how you know um, why all those names are different, whether they're Semites, Hebrews, Israelites, or Jews. See, I think that's cool. Why did you think I wouldn't care? I don't know. All right, now, so he's, he, he's, he starts by laying down, like, I'm a Jew as well. I'm an Israelite. But then he gets a little more specific. Okay, um, verse, uh, verse five. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. We've covered the Israel part. Okay, so the law was beginning with, a, with the practice of Abraham God told him as an adult man to be circumcised and to circumcise his sons. And then later on in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 12, there is the command that every male born um, in the nation of Israel, all of God's people, the males would be circumcised. They would carry that mark in their flesh. So because of Stacy's question a minute ago about can you convert to Judaism, even in the Old Testament, the answer is yes. If you're a guy, you gotta be circumcised. So what does this tell us about Paul? How long has he been a good, good little Jewish boy? The whole time, since birth. He's not a recent convert. Some of the opponents might be. They may have, have become Jews. He was born that way. Uh, he says uh, he is from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, we already talked a little bit about that. Benjamin was the one small tribe that hung with Judah in the southern kingdom. There's some notoriety there. And the first king of Israel, whose name is Saul, was also from the tribe of Benjamin. Now that's kind of an honor. He was a dud as a king. Um, but it is kind of interesting that this guy's name was Saul. And so he's a Benjamite named Saul as well. Um, he says that he is a Hebrew of Hebrews. Um, so like, you know, when they do those KTEL uh, record deals, the greatest hits of whatever era, you are all old enough to remember KTEL advertisements, even, even us. Uh, it's like the, the greatest hits of all time. Well, what, what Paul says is sort of like that, that of, of Jews, he is like 
super Jew. Um, he is extra, ultra Jew. It might be that he's pointing out that both of his parents were Jewish. He might be making reference to the fact that he didn't just speak Hebrew, but he also spoke Aramaic, which would have been a little different. Um, culturally, literally, uh, literarily, he is a Jew above anybody else who might say, well, we're Jews, just listen to us. Um, and the, one of the last things he says is that he, as, as far as the law goes, he's a Pharisee. He is a trained and respected leader. Um, uh, Paul studied under one of the greatest Pharisee teachers of, of Israel's history of all time, Gamaliel. We read about that in Acts chapter 22. Um, the Pharisees were well respected. They were powerful. They were politically conservative. And Paul was a part of that group. He's wearing a blue suit and a white shirt and a red tie every every day. <laughs> that I was like, he is he is a faithful, strong, conservative leader who follows all of the rules. And the last thing he says there backs that up. He is zealous. Uh, <clears throat> he persecuted the opponents of the law. Uh, he persecuted the church. He gave approval to the death. Of for the, the death of believers in Jesus, um, he was super on fire, a rabid Pharisee. So, as far as all of that goes, if you want to compare your story to mine, Paul says, you're going to come up short. Good luck to you. Now, the thing is that he doesn't just you know, stick his fingers in his, his suspender and say, <laughs> Look at me. You should listen to everything I say because of that. Um, he, he lays it out there, but uh, go on to verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law <coughs> people over there uh, but uh, that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith so what does Paul say about all of his his certificates and trophies and rewards on the wall it's all it means nothing it means nothing all these other people may be carrying their, their badges and their medals across their chest for everybody to look at. But Paul doesn't see his accomplishments and his heritage that way anymore. Because bragging rights don't secure salvation. There's no list of accomplishments and achievements that are, is going to bring somebody salvation forever. Paul says those things are not a benefit. They actually get in the way. Um, he says that they are loss. I consider everything, all of those beautiful things that they're bragging about, he considers all of them a, a loss. In the long run, those hurt him. At, at one point in his life, he had great pride in all of those things. He was confident in his accomplishments. Super Jew, super Pharisee, everybody loves me. I'm the next up-and-coming leader of the, the Jerusalem, what, whatever. But now, since he's met Christ Jesus, he realizes that all that he really needs is God's grace and the gifts of Jesus. They're what matter most. He says uh, there in, uh, in the text, I consider them... Garbage. Does anybody have a different translation there in verse 8? Rubbish. Rubbish. That's nice. That's sweet. That's cleaned up for Sunday school memorization. Okay, the word there is one of my other favorite Greek words. There's splunkna, which is your guts, your, your compassion. And this one is skubalon. Say it with me. Skubalon. Okay, scubalon 
Um, the, like the etymology of the word is that which is thrown to the dogs. Okay? But it's not like the pieces of steak and bread from the dinner table. That's way better than what this word means. Um, it is the, like if you were processing a deer, say, in your backyard. All, all the things that you don't want to put into a packet in your freezer, that's what you're forking over to the dogs. So, inward pieces and parts, which are awful and awful, both. Any of the um, interior waste, that's what that word can mean too, manure. Okay, so, so what Paul says, now I wanna make sure you get it here, the opponents that have come in have taken themselves and they have put themselves up on the highest pedestal they possibly can. We are the shining example of perfect faith in God. We're amazing Jews. Listen to us. We will lead you to the promised land. Paul says, oh yeah? Well, I used to be even higher than that. And you know what? <clears throat> On all of it. It's all garbage. I wouldn't give you a nickel for the whole pile. F spread it on the field. That's all it's good for. Scublon. Everything I got. Everything I have accomplished. All of my benefits and blessings. Dog stuff. Okay? Um, so, so if they are counting on anything else to matter in the world, spiritually, they are missing the point. There's not enough good you can do. There's not enough lists you can complete. You cannot earn enough points to get where you need to with God. So, a little point of application here. You don't need to raise your hand. Just think about your answers. Um, grew up in Sunday school, going every weekend. How about um, vacation Bible school every summer at least once? Weeks of church camp. Uh, volunteer at church at a young age until now. Volunteering in the community. Serving as a leader in the congregation. Going on mission trips, participating there. Willing to do a communion meditation or prayer. Speak on the stage. Go to Bible college. You preach every weekend. We might try to write ourselves a really nice resume spiritually. And Paul says, that's sweet. Throw it out. Because it doesn't, it doesn't earn you anything. The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is Jesus and the gift of salvation that his grace brings to everyone who believes. Questions or isn't comments? Serving, if you're serving like that, isn't that a gift to Christ? If you're serving... Exactly. And that's all that it is. It is when... When you stick around and wash dishes and wipe down tables and, and move chairs and tables, you're doing a beautiful thing. It is a helpful ministry to other people. But if you think that scrubbing pots or mowing yards or fixing sprinklers or teaching preschool rats is going to get you into heaven, you're wrong. But it doesn't hurt. It's a, it's a gift to Jesus. Because you have saved me, that's the big difference. I'm doing this not so you will save me, not so you'll think that I'm worthy of heaven, but I'm doing this because I'm not, and you have given me the gift anyway. So thank you, thank you, thank you. How many pots can I wash? That's the big difference between the Jewish view of favor with God and the, the Christian view of favor with God. It is the big difference between us and some of our neighbors. Well, I was going to say, it's, it's the difference between any religion and true Christianity. Any religion says you've got to do, 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 do for, to, to get rewards, where Christianity says you can't do enough. I've already given you the gift. 
it's, it's free because I've given you this gift and, and, and salvation. You want, you want to spread the love and the joy of Christ that we serve. That's, and that's the whole point of the book of Romans. When Paul goes on and on and on for 16 chapters about the law, what he says is the law is only good for one thing, showing us how horrible we are. Paul contrasts works righteousness, which is based on the law, with faith righteousness, which is from God through faith in Christ. Works righteousness based on law, faith work, uh, righteousness uh, based on God's gift and grace. So I don't have to do the dishes anymore? You don't have to. You probably won't lose salvation. You may lose your friends. <laughs> oh, I always tell my mother-in-law, I'm trying to work my place in the oven, and she's like, Susan, it doesn't work that way. Like <laughs> well, she's right. The wings and all the other stories, you know. You'll feel it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> any other thoughts or questions? Well, I, I do. This is an off, not really off topic. So, so if a Pharisee, like I know where a rabbi is, how does a Pharisee get paid? Like, I know you're a carpenter, if you're this or that. Like, where does a Pharisee, is it part of an organization within the Jewish community? I mean, how do you how do you get into one of these schools? Do you have to come from a well? There's a little more thinking about where Paul came from if he was able to go to this training. I'm just, sorry, I know this is kind of weird, but I'm curious. Okay, so the question is, how do Pharisees have money? Do they get paid for what they do? How are they selected? How does that work? I do not have a great answer for that. I know that you you would just go and study under the the Pharisee teacher. You are a student. You are a disciple of a master. So there are 12 followers of Jesus who went with him everywhere for three years. As he's the rabbi, they're the students. That's sort of equivalent to what like Gamaliel would have done. Probably not nearly as transient. But he would have had a place where students would have come, committed themselves to studying scripture, memorizing scripture, um, you know, following all the codes. I don't have an answer for that. I will have to look it up. So I guess I'm just thinking about, you know, in Paul's, in, in his, what's the word, you know, your pedigree. Just the idea that maybe he comes from something more, you know, there's there's some benefit already. He's already coming from wealth or coming from privilege where this is, a, I mean, he knows how to read, right? If you're studying scripture, you must start. Is that kind of some of that class stuff too? Like you didn't know how to read unless you were wealthy or... That's probably true. He would have been a well-educated person as opposed to the guys who grew up fishing. Well, I guess that would be the idea of the, the 12 disciples that Jesus had are probably very different than other Pharisees. Like, that's just another way that Jesus was different is that he's teaching fishermen and he's teaching The Pharisees were teaching students to follow the way of law. Jesus is teaching his followers to follow the way of grace. Of what? Grace. Forgiveness. It's possible, but I, I don't really have a great answer. In um, how many years have I been in ministry now? Since 1992? Um, in almost 30 years, nobody has ever said, how do Pharisees support themselves? They just do lunch. Well, I was just, I was really just thinking of that pedigree. Like, yeah. the, what more is there to that pedigree that you could have bragged about? And <coughs> I assume probably some wealth and comfort. Well, it might be like some, some folks we know, even if they didn't have a great deal of wealth, they would have certainly postured themselves that way because material wealth would have been a sign of God's blessing. I don't know if you know anybody um, like that. 
Okay. I think we're ready for verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul really wants to be not like some squeaky clean background checked Jewish Pharisee. He wants to become just like Jesus. And he wants to be like him, not just in the good ways, but in all the ways. You know, there, there have been people in my life that I have thought, man, if I could just be like Terry Tedder, oh man, if I could just be like Terry, I would have it made. But I want the good stuff from Terry's life. I don't want the pain and suffering of raising not just one girl, but three <laughs> girls. That's awful. I don't want to have to go through that yeah, pain and suffering. It sucks. I mean, we, 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 we do that like, boy, their life is so great. I wish I had all the stuff that goes along with being a celebrity. Yeah, you do until you realize all the other things that you don't see that are, that are awful. Okay, Paul says when he looks at Jesus, he doesn't just want the good parts. He doesn't want just, you know, the hillsides of people fawning on his every word. He wants to go all the way with Jesus through difficulty, through suffering, even to death, and then resurrection. Uh, I want to know Christ's. Uh, the power of Christ's resurrection. That's the first thing in verse 10. Um, it's not that he's looking to be physically raised from the dead, but he wants to experience the power of the resurrected Jesus in his life. I mean, how often do we think about that? Man, I really hope I feel some resurrected Jesus power today. Not just that I'm going to make it, but I'm going to really feel the power of the resurrected Christ, the new living Son of God. I'm going to feel him in my life today. I mean, for the for believers, that really ought to be a significant desire. Uh, Paul tells us in other places, like Colossians three and Ephesians two, that we've been raised with Christ. I think we talked about that last time, um, and and we've looked at Romans six verse four a couple times in the last few weeks, both on a Sunday morning and in here. Um, that we are, we are raised to walk in newness of life, a whole new approach. So let's forget about all the junk in the background, like a stupid heritage that doesn't mean anything. Let's focus instead on having the, the power of resurrected Jesus in our lives today. And that that would flow through us into the lives of other people who desperately need it. Okay? I want to know the power of Christ's resurrection. He wants to know um, Christ's sufferings. He wants to participate in those. Uh, one commentator said what he's writing about there is the afflictions which Christians must undergo in behalf of the same cause for which Christ patiently endured. Whatever Jesus went through and for the purpose that he went through it, Christians ought to be trying to do the same thing. How did Jesus suffer? Well, he laid down his life for others. He gave up what was important to himself for the benefit of others. Uh, if you go back to chapter 1, verse um, 29, uh, he was talking about suffering for Christ. That is really an inevitable consequence. If you believe in Jesus, you will suffer. Somehow, he writes that to, uh, to Timothy uh, in one of his letters. You will suffer. You will be persecuted for your faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> okay? Power of the resurrection, participation in sufferings. And then he says he wants to become like him in his death. Um, the Greek word means he wants to be um, metamorphosized. Uh, he wants that, that morpho is a Greek word to, to, 
take on the form, to, to come up alongside it, to press yourself into it. Um, so Jesus died. We need to die. We need to die to ourselves. Uh, and just like Jesus was obedient to God all the way to death, we said that a chapter ago in, in chapter 2, even death on a cross. Um, we, we see Jesus in the Garden of Eden saying in prayer to his Father, not my will but yours be done. If there is any way for this cup to pass for me, then so be it, but not my will but yours. Jesus is obedient all the way to death, and so we want to take on that same direction for our lives, that we become more and more like Jesus in every way, every day, putting off the old self, putting on the new Jesus. The last thing he says in verse 11 is that he wants to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now we might read that verse, um, and so somehow, I don't know, somehow uh, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I don't believe that is a statement of doubt on Paul's part. He's not saying, well, I don't really know how it's going to work, but I sure do hope that maybe someday, possibly, I might make it all the way to heaven. I think it's more of a statement of expectation. He, he's really said that so far in this letter. He is expecting that his faithfulness to Christ is going to ensure the completion of his salvation. Remember what he said in the last chapter? To work out your salvation. For, for us, process is both an, an, an event and a process. We can point to the moment when we gave our lives to Christ, we came up out of that water, and we know at that moment, <clears throat> saved. But then Paul says we need to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Every day after that, we continue to let that salvation live in us, to grow in us, to expand in us. So I don't think that it's possible for Paul to be sitting and going, well, I just don't know. I mean, I do a lot. I'm, I think I might maybe make it to heaven. I hope I die on a good day. I, there's more conviction in Paul than that. It's an assurance that if he is faithful to Christ, that that is what's going to ensure the totality, the completion of his salvation. It'll go all the way from the beginning event to the closing event when he is in the presence of God. It won't be his heritage, it won't be his resume, his pedigree, his credentials. It will be faith in Christ Jesus. Deep thoughts, questions, concerns. What are you taking away from this? today because that's again really the point of bible study how is this going to change how i see things from this point on we'll think about that some more Maybe it goes back to that illustration a little bit ago about all the good things that you've done. I'll even let you include the things you did before you became a Christian. You read books to kids at school. You drove a school bus. Um, you were a part of a sewing circle. Um, you sent boxes to orphans in India or Africa. Then you became a Christian and you started doing all these things. All those things are good. I don't want you to, to think that I don't believe that they have any value because they do benefit somebody else. But what we have to be sure of is that we don't believe that 
piling up a great big stack of stuff like that is going to impress God and get him to pay any attention to us. We did that. Nothing. Okay. Thanks for being here. We're going to pick up next time with Philippians 3.12 uh, and try to get through the rest of chapter 3. So um, if you missed anything, you can always go back and look at the YouTube channel under the Philippians Bible study to pick up any old ones or uh, something else. There's all kinds of good stuff there. Okay. Bye. Are we off the